I want now to open part two of the sorting unit. When we started this unit, I said it has two purposes why I want to uh, discuss sorting in detail. One, because it's, it's just a beautiful piece, um, a problem that is a, a nice playground for all sorts of uh, techniques, uh, algorithmic techniques, lower bounds, and these things that we just discussed. And the second reason was that it also is a good place to learn about parallel computation and how to use many different uh, concurrent processors. And this is what the second part will be about, how we can sort with many processors. Before we get really started with this, I want to see if uh, you have used any kind of if you have any kind of experience with uh, parallel progr programming. And let's be generous about what that really means in detail. Um, but um, most, most graphical user interface applications actually force you to use a little bit of multi-threading. So I want to see if people are, have some familiarity uh, with this. And there's no reason why I wouldn't show the results for this one. So um, let's open that one. It's not that uh, we will in any way require uh, knowledge from parallel programming um, for this module. It's more uh, for me to know how much uh, is it sensible if I make comments about how are these things addressed in practice? How are these things done in programming libraries? Whereas if, uh, so it's, it looks like half-half. So if, uh, if most of you have had not seen anything like this, I would have uh, avoided some comments. But since um, a, a large fraction of you has some experience with this, it makes sense to connect the theoretical model a bit um, to the current practical programming models. This will make more sense in a second when we discuss the... Um... Okay, <laughs> well, all is wrong. Shouldn't have been there. Okay. Um, there are different types of parallel computation uh, in general, and I want to um, briefly discuss these, and we will focus uh, on, on just one of them for this class. The core thing why people get excited about parallel computation is that money can buy you time, uh, but it can buy you more computers. So if you can just rent an entire compute center and compute a challenging problem, but in parallel on all these many computers, then it might be possible to solve a problem that it otherwise would take years and would never finish in a reasonable time. If you can parallelize it to many machines, it's just a question of how much money you want to put in it. So uh, parallel computations are, are very important these days. And uh, not only because you can buy um, easily more computers, but also because we are reaching the limits, physical limits, on how much you can further compact and speed up integrated circuits. So any future um, major speed ups will probably have to come from parallelization even the small uh, handheld devices have multiple cores. Um, so anything you do has to be parallelizable if you want to scale it up. Well, that's enough of advertisement. Um, the two types of parallelism are basically shared memory parallel computers and distributed architectures. Uh, both are important and uh, both have their place in in algorithms. Distributed computing is maybe a little less understood and therefore I'll, I'll leave it out of this discussion. Um, there are many interesting algorithms here as well, but uh, we'll focus on the shared memory parallel computer. So what do I mean by that? Again, this will eventually be a formal model of computation, um, but uh, for now, let's just keep it a little informal. We have P processing elements. Think of these as, as processors. And they can work entirely in parallel. They communicate by reading and writing from a single shared memory. 
And this is, again, like in, in the RAM model, we assume that this is uh, unbounded. It can be as big as we need it. And every PE can access every cell in memory uh, using essentially the same mechanism. This is an approximation of single big servers. And these do get fairly big these days. Um, you can easily have 128 CPU cores, maybe with hyper-threading even more concurrent um, threads that are executed. And a terabyte of main memory, even though expensive, is doable. So these are really massive machines, um, but unless you use the many cores efficiently, there's no way uh, you will make good use of that, such an expensive machine. Uh, just briefly, distributed computing is similar in that there's also P processing elements that work independently and in parallel, uh, but they have private memory. And so they can work on their private memory, but communication between processing elements is only via a defined um, interface. It can be over the network. Uh, I mean, it can be over the internet or it can be a more specialized, faster network within a, um, a high performance computer. Um, this is uh, up to applications, but you usually send explicit messages from processing element A to processing element B. So this is more like a cluster of uh, individual computers connected by a network. Again, we'll focus on, on shared memory. And um, the formal model now is the PRAM, the Parallel Random Access Machine. You know by now what the RAM is. Uh, if not, refresh your memory in unit one. Uh, what the PRAM adds to this is that there are P such processing elements, and each is essentially a RAM computer. Uh, what's important is that these, um, these individual processing elements are identified with IDs. And uh, we can use these IDs in code and we can compute with them so that, uh, again, it will become much clearer when you see an example. Uh, but it's important that they have an identity. Now, uh, we already had a parameter from the RAM, the word size, and now we additionally have a parameter P. So uh, for every problem, we now have three things floating around. There's the input size N, the number of uh, PEs, P, and the word size, W, phew. Uh, well, we'll have to deal with it, but often we can ignore the word size for the parallel computation. It often is not the, the interesting factor. And for P, we'll find um, a different solution when we go to the work span model, but um, I'm jumping ahead of myself. What has to be kept in mind is that they all can grow with N. So having an assumption or an algorithm stated with essentially a linear number of processors is not unusual. Suppose you were sorting a list of n integers and uh, the assumption there is you have n processors. So you're sorting a list of uh, a billion integers. There you go. Here you have a billion processors. If that sounds a bit unrealistic, we'll fix that later. This is um, this is the, the theoretical model. There are fixes to make it useful for practical statements. We'll come to that. All of the PEs independently run a RAM style program, and it's the same. This is maybe um, something I, I should stress here. They, they really run the same program and uh, in lockstep, they run this synchronized. Their time is, is synchronized. All the processing elements make one step after the other, but in parallel. And uh, in this RAM program, uh, we use the ID to tell uh, what is different for the different processing elements. Um, that's that's the, the way it's usually done. And it's a, it's a convenient and concise way to do it. Uh, each of the PEs has a, an own copy of registers, but mem is shared among all uh, processing elements. That's the, the shared memory model. And as I already said, um, they run in synchronous, uh, in synchronous steps. OK. Um, 
the, the assumption that they run the same RAM style program, because they can use their ID to branch off into different parts, it's not, it's not really a, a big restriction. So this, this looks like they have to go in lockstep and execute the very same thing all the time. But because you can use the ID, this is not true. So that's the, that's the model, um, the RAM model. If, again, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the chat. I'm throwing a lot of definitions at you today. And I hope um, it will later become clear uh, how these affect things. And we'll discuss some of this more in the tutorials. Uh, we'll next talk about uh, conflict management. But I first want to um, stress on this slide. Uh, this sounds all great. So they all independently run their operations. And if, if this processing element adds two numbers in its registers and this adds two other numbers in its registers, uh, nothing bad happens. The only complicated part is what happens if different several processing elements concurrently read and write the same memory cell. This is where things get complicated. And this is also where things in practice uh, get, well, either wrong or slow, or you have to make something um, sophisticated. Uh, in the PRAM, there's different versions of conflict management. What happens if you access the same memory cell? And these go from strict to more lenient. The strictest is the exclusive read, exclusive write. That means no one is ever allowed to access the same memory cell in the same time step. And if that ever happens, uh, the machine just blows up. And so you have a pro as a programmer, you have to avoid this at all costs. This is super strict and is stricter than most um, actual computers need it. So it's not used a lot, uh, but sometimes it's used uh, to, show, um, to show limits of what you can do. Uh, more flexible is the concurrent read but exclusive write model, which means it's fine if, um, if many processing elements read the same cell. Because reading doesn't create conflicts as long as the same data is written there and they read all the same value, it's, uh, it's consistent. Uh, but writing can, crea can create problems because you could write, try to write different values to the same spot and then you have to decide what wins. So the, the crew PRAM just says, this is not allowed. Whenever you write to the same cell, it has to be a single processing element. There's no parallel uh, write access. Um, you can also go to a concurrent read and concurrent write. So you do allow several processing elements to write the same cell. But then you need, uh, you need to say what happens uh, with different values that are written to the, same, um, to the same cell. And there are again different models. Uh, you can assume if this happens, they must all write the very same value. So there's nothing really to, to do. Or, and uh, unfortunately, this is closer to real hardware. If several things write at the same time to the memory, uh, same memory location, some arbitrary nonsense happens. One of them, one of the writes wins. Uh, if you're unlucky and you're not writing an atomic uh, thing, it might even happen that you have a, a chimera of, of the two values, half of the first and half of the second value. So this is, uh, unfortunately closest to, uh, to actual CPUs and memory systems. But there are ways around synchronization steps around in software to, to uh, mitigate that. Um, but it's, um, it's fairly inconvenient to program, as you might know if you have experience with that. Uh, so these are, um, these are sometimes called race conditions. Uh, which is the big plague of all parallel programming and uh, concurrent programming. This is what programmers try to avoid at all costs, and it's, it's hard to do. Um, in theory, we mostly work on the crew PRAM, so we don't allow a concurrent write access. This might seem a bit restrictive, but it really means we restrict the algorithms that we allow. And if you look at the practical solutions uh, for 
for concurrent programming, they actually try to do uh, software tricks to come closer to this. So it's, it's a reasonable decision to focus on this one. And it means we have to take care in our algorithms that we never write to the same memory cell uh, at the same time with different processing elements. All right, uh, let me check if there's any questions. Not at the moment. Um, good. Uh, if you do have questions, uh, let, me, let me know. So we defined how uh, the machine works like. We defined what a PRAM is and how programs can execute, um, at, least, at least on a high level of abstraction. What's missing is um, the execution cost of such a program. And this used to be very simple. We said in the RAM that the running time is just the number of steps that we execute. Now in the PRAM, this is a bit more complicated because we have these parallel uh, executions. So we have to be a little more uh, concrete, a bit, a bit more detailed. Uh, and there's now three, three things. Uh, space is same as before. It's the, the total amount of uh, main memory that we use. Uh, time here in, is meant as parallel time, or make span if you want, sometimes also called depth. That's the number of time steps till all parallel uh, processing elements finish. So it's uh, the maximum over all the running times of all threads if you want. Right? That's closest to the wall clock time you as a user have to wait for the algorithm to finish. And a, a new parameter is work. That's the total number of instructions executed on all processing elements. Um, if, you're, if you're just looking at time and space, then work looks uh, less interesting, but it will become interesting for two reasons. Um, one, because we don't usually have a billion of processors around, and then work will become a, a, a important. And the second thing is work might be seen as uh, proportional to the consumed energy. And uh, you do want um, energy efficient algorithms these days. So uh, just going parallel indefinitely and duplicating the work many times is not acceptable. So all three are, um, are important and we have to balance them out by choosing appropriate algorithms. Uh, the holy grail in PRM algorithms what people try to achieve is, of course, minimal time well, and space, but um, maybe that's a bit less of a, a focus. But also, you want that work of your parallel algorithm is no worse than the running time of the best sequential algorithm. OK? Uh, the running time of the best sequential algorithm for sequential algorithms, work in time is the same. Right? This is maybe an obvious comment, but I just want to make this here. Uh, so you, you try to find something that doesn't produce, uh, that doesn't do much more work overall, at least same theta class. Uh, then we call an algorithm work efficient. A parallel algorithm is work efficient if it's in the same theta class as the best sequential in terms of work. Uh, but at the same time, it hopefully achieves a good speed up in terms of parallel computation time. OK, um, I want to briefly see if you are following along on this. So a little innocent question is every computational problem solvable with a work efficient algorithm. Let's see what you think about this. Okay, I'd love to see a couple more people answer on this before I give it give it away. 23, 24. Let's do it till 30 again. 
Same as before. Come on, guys. 26. We can do more. Okay, well, the time's running up, so maybe I'll, I'll just show them now. Uh, it's roughly... Roughly half-half. And uh, so you will be interested to see the right answer. And uh, uh, the answer is yes, because um, whenever I take the sequential algorithm, we have if I have a sequential algorithm, work efficient is always with respect to a good sequential algorithm. If I take the same sequential algorithm and just declare this is my parallel algorithm, even though it only uses one uh, thread, that is work efficient. It's just a crappy parallel algorithm because it doesn't achieve any speed up. But it's work efficient uh, and you can call it parallel. It's just um, calling it parallel even though it doesn't... It's a, it's a crappy parallel algorithm. Time is bad, span is bad but uh, it's work efficient. Okay, let's move on um, to the last part of, of this introduction on the PRAM. Uh, that's a criticism that I'm, I'm sure many of you had in mind when I presented this. Uh, we don't have a billion of processors just because we're sorting a billion integers. So uh, why should I care for this uh, weird measure of uh, running time, span, and work? And the reason is that you can always simulate an algorithm that for the PRAM on uh, a, a particular machine that has a given number of processors, P. And then what you achieve is running time t plus w of p, so t is the span of the parallel algorithm, and w is its work, then the actual time you get on this machine with p processors is t plus w divided by p. And the work stays the same up to constant factors. And so this really means, um, I want to highlight this again, uh, this really means that work is important. Uh, in theory, the time is just t, just the span. But this assumes you have an arbitrary number of processors, and you usually don't. And if you actually simulate this on a machine with p processors, you get this uh, additional contribution w over p. I think um, uh, I want to briefly sketch um, how this works. Um, it's, it's a very simple construction. Um, as it says here, it's it's really just round robin round robin simulating uh, the PEs, and so um, let's suppose I have uh, here my PRAM algorithm, and that one has uh, potentially very many. Um, many, many uh, processing elements. So time proceeds top down. And now here I have, uh, I don't know, PE0, PE1, blah, 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 blah. and there can be many up to P. In each time step, each of these executes one, uh, one step. Maybe I can put myself over here. That's time step one. Time step two, we have another step, but maybe um, I think the, the dots make this inconvenient. Let's, let's keep it concrete and uh, maybe add one more. So uh, three and uh, four. Maybe they all execute something in the first two time steps. In the next two, it could be that some of them are actually dormant and they don't do anything. And maybe next time step, there's it's even more restricted. Only one is doing something. And then again, they all join and uh, do something useful. 
So this is how uh, the time progresses. That's the parallel uh, algorithm. So what we would have here is time is five, because we have five time steps. And the work is, well, whatever, you have to count. So that's 10, 15, I guess 19, up to uh, your instructor not being able to count. And uh, how do we do this if we have a machine with, say, just three uh, processing elements? What we do is a round robin simulation. So in the first time step, we use our three processors that we do have to simulate the first round of the black ones. But then we need an, an additional time step to simulate those two. So these are the first three. We just schedule them in the first time step. And the remaining two follow in the next time step. Then we do the same thing for the red ones. And again, we need two time steps here to simulate that. For the blue ones, we can actually fit them all in because there's just three. And then the green is just a single one. And then the purple, again, needs two time steps because they're all involved. Now, this clearly got more expensive. Uh, but how, how much more time do we really need? Uh, we need the original time step. Um, let's see if I'm, I'm running slightly out of colors here, but uh, I'll try to manage. For the, the original means we can essentially pay for the first step of each color here by uh, saying we needed that many steps already in the, in the PRAM execution. So that's the, the contribution of, of that part. And then the W divided by P pays for all the other ones. And so we have to uh, make sure that these steps don't sum up to more than W over P. But uh, we really have um, how many steps of this blue How many blue steps uh, can we have? Well, we always make sure that um, these are entirely full. Up to the last uh, round per time step. Per PRAM step. And that means uh, we add at most one. So we get this plus one as an upper bound. Because we make, um, we make them full as long as we can, but then we add one more for each. Um, sorry, this is a T for uh, it's one per original time step. So how many, how many steps of the blue types do we have? Here it's, it's uh, too small an example to, to show this. But in general, if this would have been um, a much larger number of processors, uh, you would pay the first three by charging to the green part. And then you would have as many as there are, but divided by P, by three, many more steps, plus one for the last one, because there could be an individual job left over. If you sum this up over all the, the t time steps, you get a contribution in total of w over p plus t for these. And uh, that extra um, amount of t just uh, vanishes in the big O notation. So uh, what this means is if we're given uh, work and span for an algorithm, we can actually estimate how long it would take to run it on a given computer with a given number of processors, just from those two numbers. And we could even um, transform such an algorithm in one into one that runs on such a machine by essentially simulating uh, this proof idea in an algorithm. And um, 
that concludes this part on, on the model for parallel computation. And looking at the time, um, I won't have time to introduce the next topic. So uh, we continue with that um, uh, tomorrow then. OK, thanks a lot. Um, I think I'll have to skip the Zoom social, but we can uh, resume that tomorrow. And uh, I'll leave the live stream open for another minute or so. If you have questions, then uh, please put them in the Q&A now. Uh, or also the Campus Wire back channel, if you wish. Um, and uh, tomorrow we'll continue. Uh, with, well, we'll continue with some actual parallel algorithms. Uh, first, for some um, toy problems, if you want, uh, it's a, a building block that doesn't seem very useful if you first see it, but then we'll see it has ample uses to parallelize our sorting algorithms. And that then will uh, bring um, our uh, sorting algorithm chapter to a close. There's one question um, about uh, this last part. It looks like you didn't use 19. You used w equals 5. Um, well, here, the work is the total number of these little boxes. That's the total work that we pay, and that's 19 here. Um, if I take the, the, I mean, okay, we can, we can compute this, this formula, but, uh, it ignores constant factors. So I think this might be, uh, why it, it, it looks far off. It's also an upper bound. Uh, this bound is, um, if you choose a, a worse example, if you always have, um, P steps that are completely full. And um, well, we have two P's, and now we reduce it to a smaller P. So that's on the that's the P RAM. Uh, say we use I don't know, capital P here and small P here. Uh, the worst occurs if this p divided little p uh, if that if that large p is the small p and it, it's just one left over k times the small p plus 1 then you always get um, k full steps where you use p so you get this k times, and then there's a single one left uh, alone. And then the the green steps is the first of these, and we get k minus one of the blue plus one. So it's in total again k of the blue steps, and so that works out to be sorry that works out to be exactly w divided p, because w on that side would be the time times p. We use uh, that many um, processors all the time. And then if, if we insert that, so that no, that's a different p, unfortunately. I would have to use that fact. So we're back at, at the beginning. It's uh, it's more useful to keep it like that. The w over p. And, and then you really get the number of blue steps is w over p, and the number of green steps is t. So the example was a bit too small um, to see the full uh, contribution that the blue part can have. I don't know if that um, helps helps under answering the question. <laughs>